there are two parts of the adrenal gland. We have the adrenal medulla and the adrenal cortex. Let's start first with the <clears throat> disorders <clears throat> affecting the cortex. So we'll come back probably next week after the exam for the medulla disorders. Let's start with the cortex disorders first. There are three <clears throat> hormones in the female. There are three hormones secreted by the cortex. They are the salt, sugar, and sex hormones. In the male, it's only the sugar and salt hormones. When we say salt, we are referring to the aldosterone. When we say sugar, we're referring to cortisol. And sex hormones would be the androgens. In the male, sex hormones, the testosterone is produced in the testicles. Okay. So only females with adrenal cortex disorders will have manifestations in the reproductive systems. Are we clear? Yeah. All right. So let's start first with the, uh, let's review. So your glucocorticoids or cortisol is a stress hormone. So this is released whenever you're hospitalized, having surgery, any stressful event, whether it's physical, emotional, or psychological stress, cortisol is increased. What does it do? Increases your blood sugar levels, prepares you for fight or flight, making sure you have en enough energy to make ATP to handle the stress. Side effects, of course, is it, it can cause severe hyperglycemia and may make the person produce more because what will we do with excess sugar? Turn it into fat. Okay, so cortisol makes us fat. Mineralocorticoids, or this is also the salt hormone, is mainly the aldosterone. So what does aldosterone do? <clears throat> it's part of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So what does aldosterone do? Reabsorb sodium and water. Okay, so <clears throat> if we have, let's just stick with the salt and sugar hormones. If your cortisol, if you're deficient in the sugar hormone, <clears throat> which is what happens in Addison's disease or adrenal insufficiency, what happens to your blood glucose level? And what happens if you have too much of it? Increases. Let's go to the salt hormone. So if you have a deficiency in aldosterone, what happens to your sodium levels? What happens to your potassium levels? What happens to your blood pressure? Okay, so we're good so far. What if you have an excess of aldosterone? What happens to your sodium levels? Potassium levels will drop. Blood pressure will you have a deficiency. You haven't, sorry, I said excess, right? Uh, excess, so blood pressure will increase. All right. So we're good. We won't discuss the uh, sex hormones for now. We'll do this when we get to Addison's and uh, Cushing's, the two exemplars we will use. But since this is not life-threatening, yes, it's concerning, especially for the female, but it's not really, again, uh, life-threatening. So it's not part of the emergency management. Are we clear? It's not a priority. Let's put it that way. Let's discuss pheochromocytoma first. Uh, this is very short. We'll finish this in under five minutes. What is it? It's a cytoma. So what does an oma mean? What does this enter? It's a tumor. It's a tumor growing where? In the adrenal medulla. What does? What are the two catecholamines produced by the medulla? epinephrine and norepinephrine. So if you have a tumor growing in the adrenal medulla, what will this tumor produce? 
epinephrine and norepinephrine. So imagine someone with this disorder who have high levels of epinephrine and norepinephrine. What will this patient look and feel like? No, at least. They have high levels of epinephrine. A very hyper person, okay? Very nervous, palpitation, high blood pressure, and uh, yeah, sweaty, all the sympathetic hormones you can talk about. Okay, they're nauseous, you know, feeling nervous, like in their fight or flight all the time. The most concerning, of course, is the high blood pressure. This patient may experience or may have complications like hemorrhagic stroke because the blood pressure here are sky high. They're over 210 systolic, over 120 diastolic. Okay. <clears throat> so because of this problem, what do you think will be the, and here are the manifestations. Okay. Again, sympathetic hormones, um, manifestations. So headache will be common because that's a manifestation of severe hypertension, correct? There is no uh, nausea, neck pain, <clears throat> dizziness, headache, uh, vision problems. So they're all mentioned here. They're, they feel flushed. Again, high levels of, of epinephrine. So eye vision problems here, vertigo, blurring of vision, tinnitus, air hunger, dyspnea. Okay, there will be increased respiratory rate as well. Here's the blood pressure I mentioned. And besides stroke, this patient may go into acute or even chronic kidney failure as well. How do we diagnose? These are the five H's. So we diagnose it clinically with the five H's. But to make a diagnosis, we will also have to examine urine and plasma as well. So if the catecholamines are sky high, then we diagnose the patient with pheochromocytoma. Now the definite diagnosis is made with the identification of the tumor. The tumor here is quite large. It's actually palpable. It's a big tumor growing on one or both adrenal glands. If it is palpable, one thing you'd never do is do not palpate it. You can touch it gently, but never palpate because palpating will do what? It will cause a sudden release of epinephrine, triggering a hemorrhagic stroke. Are we clear? Let's go straight to the management. We have a tumor. So what will this involve? Surgery. We'll take the tumor out. If the patient, for whatever reason, is not still suitable for surgery, temporarily or permanently, then management will be symptomatic. It will give the patient dozen gallons of uh, medication to control the heart rate and the blood pressure. So name all the blood pressure medications you learned from MedSearch 1. They will be on it. All your beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, your diuretics. Okay? So the patient will receive all those. And we monitor them, of course, for complications. We do cardiac and neurological monitoring to make sure uh, we catch it early if they do experience a stroke or um, a uh, heart failure or AKI. That's about it. This is our target blood pressure. Any any questions? Sorry? This is while seated. So what's it while standing up? Uh, anywhere close to that. Okay. We want, we'll be happy with anything under 180 over 110. And I'll discuss the post-op, pre- and post-op care later when we get to Cushing's, okay? Because I'll be repeating it. Um, so we'll just discuss it one time, all right? Any questions? Okay. Now, this is already for exam two, well, but we have plenty of time left, so I have to get started. Oh, this is what Oh, well, right. the last thing on the exam one is... Yes. Okay, let's go now to adrenocortical insufficiency. So this is a deficiency of the salt and sugar hormones. 
Okay. There's two forms. There's primary and secondary. We say primary. It's also called Addison's disease. If it's secondary, it's usually caused by a tumor, either on the pituitary or the adrenal gland. What is the master gland again? The pituitary gland. Okay. Again, there are two forms of, of adrenal insufficiency or adrenocortical insufficiency. Primary is called Addison's disease. And the secondary is caused by a tumor. Addison's disease is a dysfunction of the hypothalamus and pituitary gland. There's a problem with communication between these two endocrine glands, resulting in decreased levels of cortisol and these are adrenal problems. Cortisol and aldosterone. You follow so far? All right. We're only talking about um, cortisol and aldosterone, okay, for these adrenal problems. Okay, there is no ADH problems here. Okay, so I already talked about adre secondary uh, adrenal insufficiency, and it can also be caused by sudden cessation of exogenous steroid therapy. You remember in pharmacology, when someone is taking steroids for a long time, how do we stop it? We don't stop it, right? We taper off. We don't stop it suddenly. What was the rationale given to you? This is it. Okay? This is what we're trying to prevent. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about the crisis um, later because it's under complications uh, of Addison's disease. So clinical manifestations, let's keep it simple. A patient has low levels of cortisol and aldosterone. Therefore, their sugar and salt hormones are low. What is their sugars going to look like? Low. What will their sodium levels be? Low. What will their potassium levels be? High. What will their blood pressure be? Low. The manifestations mentioned here are a result of hypoglycemia, hyponatremia, and hyperkalemia. So here are your manifestations. In addition, because ACTH and cortisol are made from the same free hormone molecules, there will be hyperpigmentation of the skin. The patient will have darker skin than normal. Right, so let's say Ms. Kirku has, has Addison's disease. Her complexion will, will darken. Okay, so she will have hyperpigmentation if she has Addison's disease. There is a life-threatening form of Addison's disease or adrenal insufficiency, which results from stress, trauma, infection, or surgery, anything that is going to trigger fight or flight, because can they put up a fight or flight? They cannot because of their slow salt and sugar hormones. So therefore, it will result in a crisis. The symptoms won't be any different from Addison's disease. However, the levels are very serious. When we say hypoglycemia, it's severe hypoglycemia. When we say hyponatremia and hyperkalemia, it's severe hyponatremia and severe hyperkalemia. All right. So again, what's causing this? What will trigger this reaction, this crisis? Infection, stress, trauma, or surgery. Right. So it it can't. It doesn't have to be physical. It can also be psychological or emotional. We already discussed the manifestations. As far as the testing, there's really no nursing role here. The doctor will order cortisol uh, levels and then make a diagnosis and ACTH levels and make a diagnosis based on if they're low, then you are diagnosed with 
Addison's disease. If it's secondary, then they'll, they'll check if you have a tumor in your pituitary or hypothalamus. Here are manifestations again. We already mentioned hypoglycemia, hyponatremia, and hyperkalemia. Management is uh, depending on what form does the patient have. Does the patient have Addison's, which is primary, or do they have secondary um, adrenal insufficiency? If it's primary, then what do we do? You're incapable of producing cortisol and aldosterone. So what do we do? We we replace it. Just similar to hypo um, thyroidism, primary hypothyroidism. That's how we treated it, right? You don't have, you're incapable of producing the hormones. We give it to you. For how long? Forever. <clears throat> so these are the options. Patient will be given hydrocortisone. There is a difference between uh, managing Addison's disease and adrenal crisis though. So let's uh, differentiate the two. The description here resembles crisis. So the this section, page 1477 under medical management is really management of the crisis because Addison's disease, which is not a crisis, is simply maintained with supplemental hormones for life. Are we clear? Yeah. All right. So for crisis, meaning is the patient in shock? Yeah. Yes, pretty much in shock because severe hypotension, severe hypoglycemia, and severe hyperkalemia. <laughs> so what will be the management? Blood pressure, what is the priority? A, B, C. So we prioritize blood pressure. So the patient will be given fluids first. A little or a lot? Okay, a lot. So we'll give them lots of fluids followed by hydrocortisone. What is hydrocortisone? Okay, so what type? Is it gluco or mineralocorticoid? Actually, in a high dose form, it will have two functions. It will not only raise blood sugar, it will also raise blood pressure. Okay. So in high doses, so let's say 100 milligrams uh, dose, that will have the effect of both, okay? not just one. And at lower doses, it may just raise blood sugar, but not blood pressure. But usually at this crisis, we give them at least 100 milligrams. And then uh, followed by normal saline or dextrose, because what's the benefit of giving dextrose versus normal saline? You hit two birds with one, right? Meaning you not only raise blood pressure, you're also raising blood sugar. Because remember, the patient has hypoglycemia. And if the patient doesn't respond quickly, patient may be given vasopressors. What are examples of vasopressors again from shock? Ep epinephrine or norepinephrine and dopamine, right? Okay, so those are our common vasopressors. If infection, of course, trigger the crisis, then we give them, no, meaning if, if infection, uh, you know, sepsis triggered the crisis, then we treat them with antibiotics. And then if they go into shock, then you already know the surviving sepsis bundle, which is draw blood culture, lactate, etc. Now, if the patient is hyperkalemic, which they are, what are the options again? If you remember from last semester, how do we lower... Potassium, please be specific. What type of insulin? Lispro, Lispro, Lantern, okay, regular insulin with dextrose, what else? Calcium, gluconate, what else? Bicarbonate, you said SPS, right? SPS, sodium polystyrene sulfonate and or uh, Pativomir was mentioned by your textbook, and your textbook also mentioned something zirconium, um, localma. All right, so those are your options to lower 
potassium. What's the priority though with severe hyperkalemia? Cardiac, cardiac monitoring. monitoring. All right, and if, if they survive, we put them on a maintenance dose of steroids, which is hydrocortisone or fludrocortisone. For how long again? For a line. We'll get to the teaching uh, shortly because you have to teach them about steroids, correct? We finished the crisis already. So first, again, priority is fluid balance to raise blood pressure. Okay. Now, as far as lifelong replacement of adrenal cortex, because these are steroids, what will be a consequence of taking steroids for a long time? Is it a matter of if they'll get an infection or when? Okay, so one of these days, these patients will eventually get an infection, correct? Can they continue taking the oral steroids if they're already sick? Let's say they got COVID, they got some stomach infection, and now they're vomiting, can't eat, or worse, they're not unconscious. You said to me earlier, we cannot stop abruptly, correct? Because they will go into crisis. So how do they do it now? They're already unconscious or vomiting, unable to keep anything down. So you teach them to get a tourniquet and then shoot up, ground the, the steroids, and then shoot it up. So what's the teaching? They go to the emergency room. Or earlier, let's say when they get sick, because will their dosing be enough if they're sick? Remember, these are the hormones, the, the stress hormones that they're taking. So if they're sick, are they taking enough dose? No. Either way, they should notify the physician if they get sick. Keep in mind, sickness doesn't have to be physical. What if they are? No, it's extra stress. Let's say, oh, I'm getting married. Okay. Oh, you're already married. Uh, who's single here? <clears throat> Peguero? Yes. Okay. So, Miss Peguero, oh, I just guys got engaged, doctor. Is, is my 100 milligram enough? Oh, no. You're super excited. Okay. We'll increase it for uh, a couple months. Okay. Yeah. Understand? All right. Or if, let's say, uh, someone can, in an emergency, someone can be taught know how to give uh, IM hydrocortisone, we can, that's an option okay, in emergency scenarios. Because again, stress can precipitate a, a crisis. So it doesn't matter again, physical, emotional, or psychological stress. Notice that it wasn't necessarily a sad kind of stress, right? In Peguero's case, it was a happy kind of stress. Yeah? Okay. So here's the option, emergency kit, someone can give it IM. Oh, we have a chart actually for teaching for patients taking steroids for life, 45, 11, we'll get to that later. So the patient must be made to understand that any stress can change the hormone requirements. Are we clear? So we may need to raise or lower the hormone doses. So either way, they need to notify the physician or submit to regular because we need to monitor the blood levels anyway uh, every few months. So here's the chart for teaching. So patients who are going to be on long-term steroid therapy. So we already discussed never to stop abruptly. They have to taper. And here they are, changes in lifestyle, need to notify provider so we can change the dosing. Okay. Just dosing not only in lifestyle, but also environmental changes. No, the weather changes, that's also stressful. Diet, we need them to have high carb, high protein with adequate sodium intake. 
they need to know what are the signs of a crisis. So the signs and symptoms listed in the paragraph earlier, which were consistent with hypoglycemia, hyponatremia, and hyperkalemia. And that's it. Any questions on Addison's? Okay. So let's summarize. Addison's is primary, right? Then we have secondary, which is caused by usually either a tumor or sudden cessation of long-term steroid therapy. And the management was replacement, right? Okay. All right, let's go now to the opposite. The opposite is Cushing's syndrome. Cushing's syndrome is the term we use if the patient's uh, when we say Cushing's, this is the opposite of Addison's, where in Addison's or adrenal insufficiency was a deficiency, right, mm -hmm. of salt and sugar hormones. When we say Cushing's, it's now an excess, excess salt and sugar hormones. So the opposite of the signs and symptoms we said earlier, so this will have high sugar, high blood pressure, high sodium, low potassium. We call it syndrome if the increase in steroid levels, whether glucocorticoid or mineralocorticoid, is caused by an exogenous source, meaning where did the hormones come from? From the patient's own body or from outside? It's If it's outside, we call it Cushing syndrome. So can a cause of this a too much hormones from treating Addison's? Yes. So Addison's disease patients or adrenal insufficiency patients, can they develop Cushing syndrome? Yes. yes. If the hormone production, increased hormone production is caused, is coming from the patient's own body, which can be caused by either a tumor again from the pituitary or a tumor in one or both adrenal glands, we call it Cushing's disease because the treatment will be the same. Manifestations, therefore, are exactly the same. However, again, because the causes are different, are they treated the same? Well, how do you think we will treat if it's Cushing syndrome, knowing that, oh, it's an over, over medication? Okay, so we're going to adjust the medication dose. That's how we treat Cushing syndrome. How do we treat Cushing's disease? It was caused by what again? A tumor either in the pituitary or one or both adrenal glands. So what's the treatment? Surgery. Okay, so we'll discuss surgery when we get to disease. So manifestations, I won't repeat because it's the exact opposite of um, Addison's or adrenal insufficiency. So high sugar, high blood pressure, high gluc uh, high sodium, low okay. potassium. All right. Moreover, because of the severe high sugars here, the patient will convert the sugar into fat, correct? And there will be several fat deposits here. Let's start with the face. The face, the back of the neck, they will have a buffalo hump. They will have uh, abdominal obesity. The extremities, though, will be thin. However, because of the sodium, high sodium levels, they will have edema. Edema will be in all, all over the body. There will be, because of the increased fat deposits, there will be, of course, a weakening of the muscles, resulting in protein catabolism, muscle wasting, so they'll eventually develop these spine abnormalities. Uh, blood pressure results, uh, blood, blood pressure rises, sorry, uh, as a result, and they will develop heart failure as well, similar to SIADH. But again, there's no ADH um, uh, um, involvement here, only sodium and water. So is this going to be a concern for a female patient right. yes very uh, very concerning there's no picture here but let me uh, there is one picture the one you're looking at this is actually a woman 
This is not a man. This is a woman with Cushing syndrome. This is what a patient could look like because of the excess sexual hormones. Okay, because the, the female hormones are so high, they'll start growing hair in places where you normally don't see hair in a female. Here's the buffalo hump, and we don't see the rest of the body, but there will be, imagine, abdominal obesity. Now, the, the stretching, because the, the weight here develops so fast, unlike you know when you're eating, it takes a while right before you gain weight. This one happens so fast. Whether or not the patient eats, the fat deposits will increase because of the severely high blood glucose. It affects the uh, glucose metabolism. They can also develop diabetes as a result. Now, there will be stretching and thinning of the skin here. So there will be several stretch marks. Uh, purple something, right? Yeah, purple striae will develop. There will be some spider, you know, spider veins up, up, uh, appearing. The skin will be very thin because it's all stretched. So they're at risk for skin tears, injuries, bleeding. And because of the weakening, what happens again to um, the, the gastric acid secretion when you have high stress, high harm, okay, will increase, right? So are they at risk for peptic ulcers? Yes. And what happens to calcium absorption now? Affected, can they develop osteoporosis? And are they at risk for pathologic fractures now? Okay, so all of that will occur, okay? Yeah, because in the female, they will have high female hormones so aldost i mean um yeah estrogen progesterone will be will be high so these are the manifestations it's all the body systems will be affected right from cardiovascular skin okay so we we mentioned most of these already and don't forget the um a high risk for infection a, because of the high steroid levels. So testosterone level will also be high? Yes. For the woman, female. Females also have testosterone. You're aware of that, right? Yeah, just like males also have estrogen and progesterone. We just have different levels. Okay. For males, Well, yeah, if you take uh, hormones, yes. Ah uh, yes, if a man is is uh, affected, uh, no no because remember I said, where are the male hormone sex hormones located in the testicles? So this is our male horm sexual hormones are not from the adrenal glands, so males will not be affected. Males will still look like you know fat. We we have everything else, but not the sexual characteristic changes meaning we won't have the libido changes the uh, obviously we don't have the menstrual changes as well okay you follow so far yes. okay so it's it's um extra depressing right if it if the patient is female okay, for obvious reasons We will skip the testing. Again, we don't have any role in the testing. The doctor will order lab tests and then the results will be the basis for the diagnosis. Let's go to management. So we have too much hormones now. We said if it's Cushing syndrome, how do we manage it? adjust the dose okay obviously we're giving the patient was taking too much so we will adjust it now set expectations realistically it will not be an overnight thing wherein your body image will go back to normal they will remain for a long period of time but it will improve eventually in time uh, to an acceptable level it will never be back to your sexy free hormone uh, treatment um, levels, 
Okay, so make sure the patient understands. Okay, you won't look like uh, you before you were like Angelina Jolie. Okay, now you'll probably look like. A younger Rosie O'Donnell. Okay, <laughs> some like that. Like if a patient want to have like cosmetic surgery, would insurance pay for this? You mean what? What? What cosmetic surgery? Um, I mean you want to do Bello? You know, Sono Bello? Uh -huh. uh, that will just be a temporary fix. It will go back again. Oh. Okay. remember, this is not caused by. Oh, the stripes. Thing. Yeah. The stripes yeah, because this is this is you know from the hormones. Okay? Plus, it's not like you can stop the hormones. You're gonna keep taking it. But yeah, let's say you're preparing for. A wedding you know, to make sure you get married. You, know, you you do that you know, just for the marriage time, and then after that, uh, this is you know I'm on steroids. Okay, if you get divorced, at least you know there was no prenup, so you still get you know you get what's due to you. Okay, now let's go to if it is what if it's Cushing's disease. So we said it's gonna be surgery, correct? All right. So if it's Cushing's disease, then it will be surgery. Or sometimes it's radiation. Um, but let's do surgery. Keep in mind, let's say adrenal, um, adrenal surgery first, okay? So let's say the tumor is in one or both Ooh. adrenal glands. All right. So we're going to remove the tumor. Unfortunately, Ooh. the tumor is as big or bigger than the adrenal gland. So the gland will be lost here. So if it grows on one gland, then the patient will lose one gland. If it's on both, unfortunately, they will lose both adrenal glands. In the first scenario, if they lost one adrenal gland due to surgery, do they develop adrenal insufficiency? No. No because they still have one gland. However, will they require hormone replacement for a period of time? Yes, because the remaining gland will take, will need some time in order to compensate for the loss of the other gland. So for a while, maybe up to two years, okay, several months to uh, right here. So temporary replacement will be necessary for several months until the other gland catches up. All right. Any question? What if I lost both? What if I have the tumor on both adrenal glands? Then I will develop adrenal insufficiency. However, how did we treat adrenal insufficiency again? Hormone replacement. And because of hormone replacement, I keep changing the dose. What could I potentially develop? Pushings. Syndrome. Syndrome. So if you were the patient with Cushing's disease, what are you going to say? I know what you're going to say. So the doctor explained all this, right? So I will say I have a Cushing's disease with two tumors. So I will say, let me get this straight. I have Cushing's disease. And you're telling me you're going to have, you're going to give me surgery. You're going to take both out along with the tumor. Then I'm going to be taking hormones for life, and I could potentially develop Cushing syndrome. It's like 360, right? Not 180. It's a 360. I'm right back where I started. But this is what's this is the only option, right? So make sure the patient understands that some may say, Oh, I'm gonna have surgery. Oh my god, thank you. Well. Take note that the treatment causes adrenal insufficiency, which means hormone replacement for life, which could potentially lead to Cushing syndrome. So from Cushing disease to now Cushing syndrome. But at least they'll live. We'll skip the treatment because there are there's mention of treatment here. This is only temporary. Right? This is not a permanent solution for Cushing's disease. This is only for temporary. So let's say there's some 
infection or something? Because remember, these patients are prone to infection, right? So let's say they have an active infection. Can they undergo surgery? Not yet. We have to finish the treatment of the infection. So meanwhile, to control the hormone levels, these are the treatments. Okay, only temporary, never permanent, meaning nobody will be on these drugs forever. All right, only temporary because the permanent treatment is what? Surgery for Cushing's disease. Now, what if the Cushing's disease is caused by a pituitary tumor? What will be the surgery? Okay, hypopisectomy. Did we discuss that last semester? No. Okay, so let's go to <clears throat> hypopisectomy. Under pituitary tumors, under surgery. Okay. So page 1451. Hypopisectomy is the surgical removal of the pituitary gland through a transphenoidal approach. Because the, the, uh, the pituitary gland is behind the eyeball, this is the preferred approach as, to, as opposed to performing a craniotomy because if you open the skull, then that means you have to go through the brain to get to the pituitary gland. So the pituitary gland is safer access through the nose. So imagine, you use your imagination. So they'll put instruments through both nostrils and also open your mouth, make a small incision at the roof of the mouth to put additional in instruments through there to reach the pituitary gland and remove the tumor and the pituitary gland. Is there any way to save the pituitary gland? It's a pea-sized gland. The tumor is 10, 20 times bigger than it. No way. So it's gonna you're gonna lose the pituitary gland. So after surgery, first of all, is this brain surgery? Yes, because the pituitary gland is in the brain. So it is brain surgery. So after surgery, will we monitor neurologic status? Okay. Could there be any CSF leak? Could there be bleeding? So the drainage, will it be clear or bloody? It's going to be bloody. So can you tell whether there's, there's CSF fluid in the blood or not? How? Very good. Okay, so what's the test we use? No, we don't test for glucose because blood has glucose. It's always going to be positive. So that's not going to be uh, reliable because, again, the, the drainage is bloody. So, of course, it's going to have... Sugar, correct? Okay. So the other is will will the other reliable method is to do remember the halo sign? When we okay, let's go to the post up. It's not here. Oh, it's in chapter 61.
All right, so we are on page 2016, chapter 61 for the pre and post op care. <clears throat> so, pre op, we teach the patient what to expect. Imagine again the surgery will involve instruments passed through both nostrils and up uh, through an incision at the roof of the mouth to get to the pituitary gland. So in order to reach the brain, they will remove the sphenoid bone. That's why we call it transsphenoidal approach. So we'll cut through the sphenoid bone, put the instruments through, and then take out the tumor and the pituitary gland. So because there's bleeding, are we going to pack the nose? Yes, there will be a packing in the nose postoperatively. So the patient, can they breathe through the nose? Yeah. No. So they'll have to breathe through their mouth. Because there is an incision of the roof of the mouth, they will be uh, restricted from brushing their teeth. They are allowed to do antiseptic rinses, okay? so mouthwash, um, unflossing, but no brushing their teeth because you might hit the incision. Because, again, there's a chance of CSF leak, we will have to check the drainage for CSF. I can't find where exactly the halo sign is, but uh, I'm sure it's in a different chapter. You're going to, they can eat. Uh, you will going to get a clean piece of gauze and dab the drainage, uh, the bloody drainage, and then observe the the drainage on the clean piece of gauze. If there's a yellow ring around the blood, if a yellow ring appears around the blood, we call that a halo sign that is positive for CSF. Okay, that's the only acceptable test. Because again, if we use a dextrose sticks to test for glucose, of course it will be positive because the drainage is bloody. Are we clear? All right. Sounds primitive, but it's an effective way to check for CSF uh, presence in the drainage. And because this is brain surgery, what are activities that we restrict in order to prevent incre in increased intracranial pressure? Okay, so anything that will cause the patient to hold their breath. Okay, so do you hold your breath when you sneeze, when you cough? When you have a when you give birth to a really big turd, yeah. when you bend down to pick up something, yeah. when you sing like Mariah Carey, yeah. when yeah. you the yawning is fine because yawning you're actually breathing deeply. You're not holding your breath when you yawn. Oh yeah, they can drink and eat normally. All right, so all oh, sexual activity. Can they have sex? You don't hold your breath when you're having sex? That is restricted, okay? So no sexual activity. All right, that about covers it. So we did pre and post-op for, okay, I forgot. Uh, let's go back to adrenalectomy. Pre- and post-op care for adrenalectomy requires special preparation. You remember diabetes insipidus and SIADH? What were the listed causes? Brain surgery, correct? So after hypophysectomy, can the patient possibly develop diabetes insipidus or SIADH? Okay.
Okay. So here's treatment surgery for if it's caused by a tumor, meaning this is Cushing's disease. <clears throat> so adrenalectomy, right, is the option. So we already discussed unilateral adrenalectomy, so no problem with that. We know that there will be on uh, steroid replacement for how long? Several months to up, maybe up to two years, okay? uh, depending on how long the remaining gland uh, can compensate. Okay, What if it's both? Remember, the patient's cortisol and aldosterone levels, what were they before surgery? Very high. When we do surgery, we suddenly take out both adrenal glands. So what will happen to the levels of the hormones? Did it drop slowly or suddenly? It dropped suddenly because you stopped the production because you took out the gland. So what can result? What do we call that life-threatening scenario again? Adrenal crisis, acute adrenal insufficiency or acute adrenal crisis. Can they die? Yeah. Yes. So how do we prevent that? We have to remove the tumor and the adrenal glands. We give them hormones. When? Before surgery. Do we continue it during surgery? Yes. While they're having surgery, do we continue the infusion? No, think about it. You're going to cut it and take it out. So production from the patient's body will stop. So do we give before? Do we give during? Yes. What about after? Yeah. Forever after. Correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because now they have adrenal insufficiency and they have to be taking hormones for life. You understand? All right. That would be it.